I kind of like more the uh, the old tradition that uh, the preacher would actually sit down and the rest of the people would stand. <laughs> but uh, it's me against all of you, so I'm going to lose that one, I think. So, yeah. So a couple of weeks, uh, Father Nathan asked me to preach on Ephesians 3. And my heart fell a little bit. First of all, because it's Paul and... Paul's difficult to read at times. Uh, And uh, also, as I was preparing the text and I was reading through the text, there's so many, yeah, there's just an abundance of ideas and thoughts and riches. And I was like, huh. I mean, once uh, the moment I was uh, thinking about one idea, then other ideas were waving their hands. How about me? So which idea do you pick? So, but today I'd like to explore one question, just one question, and it's a question many of of us uh, will probably ask, am I worthy? Am I worthy? Can you hear it with my accent? I always feel like that's a difficult word, so I will say that many times, so worthy, yeah? So in order to answer this question, I'd like to start talking about the life of Paul, also named Saul of Tarsus. And about one third of the New Testament is written by this one author, eh, Paul. So, yeah, so Paul has exerted quite an influence on the church. And Paul was born in Tarsus. And Tarsus, do you know where Turkey is? Yeah, it's kind of close to the coast on the Mediterranean and then a little bit closer to Syria than to Greece. Yeah, so about a mile from the coast. And Paul was a Jew. And uh, a member of the tribe of Benjamin. And Paul was also a Roman citizen, as we know. And Paul, just kind of a few little facts here. So Paul studied with the famous Rabbi Gamaliel, and he became a Pharisee. Yeah. Now, the first time we encounter Paul in the Bible is not a great time for Paul. Yeah. The first time we encounter him in the Bible is when... The first martyr, Stephen, is killed for his faith. Yeah? And Paul is witnessing and approving the execution of the first mar- martyr in the Bible that we know of. Yeah. So, and then right after the execution of Stephen, we read in the book of Acts that Paul was ravaging the church and entering house after house. He dragged off men and women and committed them to prison. So Paul was a very dedicated enemy of the church who actively persecuted Christians and tried to destroy the church. And long after Paul became a Christian, he reflects on his past in his plea to Agrippa. And Paul says, I did so in Jerusalem. I not only locked up many of the saints in prison after receiving authority from the chief priest, but when they were put to death, I cast my vote against them. And I punished them often in all the synagogues and tried to make them blaspheme, blaspheme Christ. That's what he was trying to do. And in raging fury against them, I persecuted them even to foreign cities. This is our Paul. Yeah? Paul. Yeah. So, and this work against the church of Paul came to an abrupt end on the road to Damascus. Now, all of you know the story, so I won't have to go into detail. But... It was only through the direct intervention of Jesus that Paul converted and that his heart was changed. And Paul's whole life was turned upside down and the trajectory of his life was completely changed. Instead of a Pharisee, he became an apostle of the church to the Gentiles. Instead of persecuting the church, he became persecuted. Persecuted. 
So before we move on, I want to uh, kind of touch upon one thing that's important to uh, uh, yeah, know a little bit more about, or understand the conversion of Paul a little bit better. So Paul was a Pharisee, as I've uh, stated earlier, and there were about 6,000 Pharisees during that time, during the time of Paul, and that's what they think. And uh, the name Pharisee comes from the Hebrew word that means separated ones. Yeah, so the Pharisees, they were all about purity. Yeah, so they wanted to make sure that anything that could defile them, that they would stay away from that. Yeah, and what do you think about pagans and Gentiles? Could they have defiled them? Yes, of course. So what did they do? They stayed away from those Gentiles as far as they could. Yeah, so keep that in mind as we continue. So when Paul converted to Christianity, there were major changes in his life. Yeah. So first, Paul was a persecutor of the church, and now Paul becomes a key leader of the church that, who is persecuted. And because of his past, you see that Paul refers to his past several times in his letters. Eh? So you see that Paul refers to himself as the very least of all the saints. We read that today, yeah? or as the least of the apostles, unworthy to be called an apostle, and as the foremost of sinners. Yeah, another change. So in the past, Paul completely separated himself from the Gentiles and shunned them, but now he becomes an apostle to the Gentiles. Yeah, and in today's epistle reading, we read that Paul refers to himself as a prisoner of Christ Jesus on behalf of you Gentiles. Yeah, so before his conversion, Paul would have been appalled by what, what he became after his conversion. I mean, he became a Christian. I mean, he hated Christians. Eh? We have read that, eh? I've uh, heard about it. And he became a friend of Gentiles, exactly the people he was always shunning at all cost. And not only, he did not only become a friend of the Gentiles, he even had good news for these Gentiles. <laughs> awful, awful, yeah. A message that he would have ridiculed and fought with all his might before his conversion the Gentiles as fellow heirs and members of the same body. I mean, Paul would have been like, ah, oh. that was just, that was like exactly the opposite that he had stood for for so many uh, years of his life. And then we go to Ephesians 3, verses 8 and 9, and Paul summarizes these changes. He writes, To me, though... I'm the very least of all the saints. This grace was given to preach to the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ and to bring to light for everyone what is the plan of the mystery hidden for ages in God. Does Paul feel worthy? No. He refers to himself as the very not kind of, or not somewhat, but no, the very least of all the saints. Eh? But though he considered himself to be the very least of all the saints, he still knew that he was one of the saints, which is interesting. Eh? So he felt yeah, the very least, but it's still one of the saints, despite of all the wrong that he had done. And he felt he was still saint, one of the beloved children of God. And to me, it's kind of interesting eh? that from a Pharisee, he becomes a saint. From a separated one, he becomes one that is set apart. So in a certain sense, there's some similarity there, but in a very different context. And though he considered himself to be the very least of all the saints, God still gives him a calling gives them the grace to preach the good news to the Gentiles. So despite of his past, he was not cast aside by God. 
but God gave him the grace. Yeah. So Paul was supposed to preach the gent to the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ. Were the Gentiles, were they worthy of these unsearchable riches of Christ? No. I mean, last week, we, we read about it in Ephesians 2, that Paul wrote early in the epistle to the Ephesians that they were dead in the trespasses and sins. Yeah? So before Paul's conversion, before his conversion, Paul would have looked down on the Gentiles as sinners. And sinners, he had to avoid at all cost. And now he is equally a sinner. On the road to Damascus, Paul was asked a question by Jesus. Why are you persecuted, persecuting me? And in persecuting Christians, Paul had persecuted Christ. Paul always thought he had led the perfect life. I mean, for the Gentiles, uh, in the past, before his conversion, he looked down upon the Gentiles and he felt like, yeah, I'm just perfect. And he writes that also in Philippians 3, verse 6, that he was righteous under the law. And he was blameless, Paul. That's what he thought about himself. But now, after Christ met him on the road to Damascus, Paul realized he's not that much different than all those Gentiles he so much despised. He's the same. He's a sinner, just like the Gentiles. And because Paul realizes he needs God's grace as much as the Gentiles, and because he learns of God's wonderful and gracious plans for the Gentiles, Paul is able to accept the calling as apostle to the Gentiles. And Gentiles are not only fellow sinners now, but they're also fellow heirs and members of the same body and partakers of the promise in Christ Jesus. What an amazing news. Yeah, what an amazing news. Yeah. So let's go back to that question we started with. Am I worthy? Are we worthy? Despite Paul's past as an enemy of God's church, God gave Paul a beautiful calling. It was a calling that stretched him. He had to do all kinds of things that he really did not want to do. <laughs> kind of awkward. Yeah. So he had to interact with Gentiles. He had to bring them the good news that they were God's beloved, just uh, like the Jewish brothers and sisters. And what he despised in the past, he now considers a grace. Think about the turnaround, to think about the conversion. Eh? So, and then look how God used Paul. Eh? Paul was deeply ashamed of his actions of his former life. Deeply ashamed. And probably you may be ashamed also of things you may have done in the past. You may have some skeletons that you keep in your closet, you know, safely. Yeah. You may have dark secrets the stench of which kind of appalls you to this day. You may still be haunted by all kinds of thoughts you cannot suppress. Was Paul worthy of the grace given to him? No, he was not worthy. Were the Gentile Ephesians worthy of the grace? No. Are we worthy of the grace of God? No. But the unsearchable riches of Christ are ours. They are ours. We are fellow sinners with Paul and the Gentile Ephesians, but we are also fellow heirs and members of the same body and partakers of the same promise in Christ Jesus through the gospel. And just like God used Paul despite of his past, God can and will and wants to use you and me, even if you feel ashamed because of certain things you've done in the past. The saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am the foremost. 
it's kind of a bummer that uh, you don't see that in the <laughs> in the liturgy those last few words of whom i'm the foremost yeah paul's sense eh? paul's sense of unworthiness did not cripple his calling how often do you feel like you know i shouldn't be doing that you know because my life it's not perfect uh, eh? this guy eh? but paul sense of unworthiness did not cripple his calling he did not consider his past as a denial of his calling and many people would allow eh, their unworthiness their failings maybe current failings still eh, and frustrations with yourself many people allow those to guide their lives you're not good enough you're not good enough think about what you've done are you really thinking you could be doing that? Something that huh, special? No. Think about who you are. You're not worthy of any of these special things. And these dark thoughts of unworthiness can lead us to apathy and an inability huh, to become human beings fully alive, which is the glory of God. It leads to an inability to follow our calling given by God. Our sense of unworthiness causes us to deny our calling. So first we sin, and then as a result, we do not take God's calling seriously. This way, we sin twice. Paul, by taking his calling and grace uh, and grace seriously he was able to do far more abundantly than he could have even imagined could paul have imagined that here in the united states two thousand years later we still would read his letters to those churches think about it if paul would not have followed god's calling i would not be preaching right now on this text This, all this has only been possible because Paul remained faithful to the grace and calling he received from God, despite his sense of unworthiness. So now the next question, and the last question, trust me. Yeah, <laughs> the last question is how did Paul do that? Eh? How did he have the deep sense of unworthiness? And how was he still able to remain true to his calling? How did he kind of integrate that? Because for me, that's still a struggle also. And I think I can imagine for some of you, it might be a struggle. That sense of unworthiness and what you know to be true that God wants you to do. So how did he reconcile that? I mean, Paul, when he uh, was at the night by himself, I could see that he still, those images from the past came back to him of Christians begging him to leave them alone. Women that he just grabbed may, uh, maybe by the hairs and uh, took them with him. People that he made sure got murdered and killed, eh? executed. I think all those images were very vivid in his memory and were seared on his retina. And despite this, He's true to his calling. And the secret, I think, is at the end of this passage. It's the prayer that he prays for the people, the Gentiles of Ephesus. Paul was strengthened with power through God's spirit in his inner being. Christ dwelt in his heart through faith, and Paul was rooted and grounded in love. And with his mind, he did not dwell on the past, but asked to have the strength to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth, the length, and height, and depth, and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge, and that he may be filled with all the knowledge and fullness of God. And this is how Paul remained faithful to his calling, despite his deep sense of unworthiness. And it's my prayer for all of you, and also for myself, eh, that we remain true to our calling, despite all the dark voices that we often hear, the voices of the old enemy, the serpent, the evil one, the accuser. Satan means accuser. Eh? 
voices that we are not worthy, voices that remind us of our failings, voices that break us down, voices that prevent us from being human beings or becoming human beings fully alive. Let us ask God today that we may get the double portion of Elijah's spirit poured out on us, that we can be... <clears throat> Uh, remain, uh, that we can remain faithful to our calling on our lives. And it's God only that turns the rock of our hearts into a pool of water, the flint of our being into a spring of water. Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all that we ask or think according to the power at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. Amen.